This video was going to be the first part in an electronics build project to make a small portable computer. In a way, it still is the first episode of that project because I haven't given up completely. The theme of this particular piece, though, is different from what I thought it would be. I thought this would be the fun story of the success of part one, but instead this video is actually going to be about deciding to stop doing a thing that isn't working. I mean, that should be easy, right? Well, apparently not, because I struggled on with this for weeks. So join me, if you like, as we walk through each rather painful step along the journey. I'm not actually going to build very much of this from scratch. In fact, I'm going to try to make this something that's built out of off-the-shelf components as far as I can. So I'm going to kind of Frankenstein a bunch of things together to try to make a portable computer based on bits and pieces I can get from here and there. So kind of naturally for this sort of application, the computing part is going to come from a Raspberry Pi Zero 2, which I've got there. So I was amazed how small these things are. Look, look at that. It's a fully fledged computer that fits in the palm of your hand. I knew they were small, but I, until I held one, I kind of wasn't really aware of exactly how small. But there we go. So the Raspberry Pi Zero 2. Now, why not the Raspberry Pi 4 or the Raspberry Pi CM4 compute module or something like that? Well, mainly because more power consumption and heat management. This is not as powerful computationally as a Raspberry Pi 4 or compute module or whatever, but I don't need all of that power. I'm not intending to play games on this thing, although that probably will be possible anyway. I really want something that consumes a small amount of power that will run for a long time on batteries and possibly can be charged by solar or other things and can be used out in the field for, I don't know, time-lapse photography, for example. So in addition to that, I've got this, which is the Witty Pi 3 Mini. And this is a device that's intended to be a power supply and a real-time clock module for the Raspberry Pi Zero, or in fact, any of the Raspberry Pis. So this will slot on top. It gives me a power button, which will be a graceful shutdown for the Raspberry Pi, rather than just yanking the power. But notably, when you press the, when you actually shut down using this module, it shuts down all the peripherals and things as well. So that's necessary for this sort of application. So that's the Witty Pi 3. Mini, And then for power supply, I've got this little module here, which is actually designed to go inside of a uh, power bank. So you would just attach a bunch of lithium ion batteries to these two tabs here, battery minus and battery plus, and it provides a power bank, basically with a fast charge socket and a regular USB power socket out. And then these are the inputs here. It's got USB-C, micro USB, and lightning. And which is quite good actually. I'll probably try and retain those and we'll have something that can be charged from a bunch of different possible inputs, which makes it versatile. I may desolder this standard USB port here so that I can actually wire directly into the power input for the Witty Pi. I'll probably keep one socket so my little mini computer can still be used as a power bank. Even when it's turned off, it can power other things or charge other things if necessary. That seems like a useful thing to do. Now, the Raspberry Pi Zero has only got one USB port, which is one of these USB micros here. The other one is just power. This one is uh, this one here is power and data. So it's only got one actual USB peripheral port, which is a bit of a limitation. So I'm going to hack this little uh, USB 2 hub, which has got four ports, and I will take the circuit board out of that and we'll build that into the thing as well. And again, some of these USB ports here will be used for internal stuff. So I'll probably desolder the socket and solder the wires directly in. But at least one of them will keep on the outside of the unit so that it can connect to webcams or external storage or whatever I want to plug in there. So there's two kind of big components still missing here. One is the display, which I haven't decided what I'm going to do with yet. I have seen some seven inch LCD display panels on the market where you can turn the backlight off and in bright sunlight, it acts as a transflective display. So you can still use them in bright lighting conditions and you can save power by having the backlight turned off. That sounds like a good idea to me. It's a bit like that um, OLPC project where it was a very low powered laptop designed for developing countries. You, and you could turn off the backlight and enjoy quite a long run time as a result of that. I'm hoping I might be able to do something like that. So the screen, I haven't decided yet, but it might be something along those lines. Typically those are HDMI screens, and this has got HDMI out, and it'll use USB probably for touch screen in. 
So the other thing I haven't talked about yet is the keyboard. How are we going to do the keyboard? Well, there are a number of different ways people do this. Sometimes people use a Bluetooth keyboard, and so they just plug the Bluetooth dongle into this thing, or maybe use onboard Bluetooth on the Raspberry Pi if it's got it. Can't remember if this one does. And then they have their Bluetooth keyboard that communicates via Bluetooth inside the casing. I don't really like that. I don't know why, but I don't really like the idea of having something that communicates via radio inside the casing to its motherboard. It just, something about that seems wrong to me, so I'm not doing that. Another possibility is to get an off-the-shelf keyboard, and there are some off-the-shelf I2C keyboards, and there are some off-the-shelf small USB keyboards. The smallest sort of commercial keyboard you can get is about the size of the Raspberry Pi 400 keyboard. And, and then one other kind of broad range of possibilities is to use a microcontroller, like a Teensy or something like that, um, and build my own keyboard matrix and program the microcontroller to act as a USB keyboard, which lots of people do, and that's probably the right way to do it if you want a custom keyboard. I'm going to do something a little bit like that, but also a little bit different and a little bit kind of typically Atomic Shrimp. I'm going to bodge it. So let's go to that segment right now. So what I've got is a standard keyboard, a really, really cheap one. I bought this for £3 in a charity shop, and it's new as far as I can tell. And it's, it's incredibly poor quality. Watch this. Look at that. Now, I'm not very worried that bending it like that will damage the PCB that's in here because I don't think there is a PCB in this part of the keyboard. I don't think there's actually any printed circuit board other than perhaps somewhere around here. We'll see. First thing I'm gonna do is take a photo of this keyboard. So I've got the keyboard layout captured and then we're gonna take it apart and see what's inside. So lots of screws to undo. Let's get cracking with that. Really don't know why a keyboard that's as flimsy as this one would need this many screws holding it together. It's kind of bizarre. I'm surprised they didn't just glue it, to be honest. Keyboard brand here is Voltec, although the box that it came in doesn't have that branding on it. And I'm sure this is a I probably should have tested this first. I'm sure this is a working keyboard, but this is really the kind of keyboard you might buy if you've got no other choices. If you just need a, a replacement keyboard in a hurry and you buy this one at some discount store or something like that. I suppose it might also be a, quite a good keyboard for an environment where the keyboard's gonna get ruined, like a workshop PC for a CNC machine or something like that. It might be a good choice to buy a really dirt cheap keyboard that nobody's going to cry about if you get sawdust and stuff in it. I think what we're going to find in here is a membrane, a rubber membrane, over a plastic kind of keyboard grid, a plastic contact grid. So I think we're going to find there's a film of plastic with some printed lines on it, some conductive printed lines on it, and a rubber sheet with little deforming rubber domes that have conductive pads inside them and press to make contact with the oh that's why it's got some <laughs> that's why it's got so many screws i think i might have to there's two more to undo that here okay fine we'll just keep going <laughs> okay this is why it's got so many screws is because the plastic is so flimsy that it would warp if it didn't have this many screws sandwiching it together oh well fun times so yeah, that many screws. Feel free to count those and stick a count on the comments if you wish. Ah yes, my expectations are significantly met. So what we've got is a, oh, I, th I thought that, no, okay. So slightly different from what I expected. Lots of little singular deforming rubber caps. I expected there to be a single sheet of rubber here with all of these caps built into it. But no, apparently we've just got lots and lots of individual single caps with a tiny little piece of conductive, you can't even really see it actually, but I assume, oh no, it's not actually. Do you know what this is? This is two layers. Oh, wow. Okay. So, okay, quite quite a little bit different from what I expected. So we've got two layers. Let's get it all out and we'll have a look at it. So I think it's all screwed in. Right, 
Okay, so there's three layers. So there's a layer of contacts, there's a clear layer with holes in it, and there's a third layer with the other side of the contacts. And what's happening here is when you press down on these little rubber domes, it's squishing those two sheets of plastic together through the holes in this middle sheet and making contact. That doesn't seem like the most reliable mechanism to me, but no, no matter, it's not the mechanism I'm going to use. What I'm actually interested in is, let's get, I'm gonna to have to take it out. There's a little rubber strip there, holding that down. Let's get rid of the membranes. What I'm actually interested in is this little PCB here, because essentially what we've got to do now is reverse engineer this matrix so we find out which where the columns and rows go, build our own keyboard matrix that resembles that and connects to the grid, connects to the headers on this PCB. It's got three little LEDs which shine through holes there and out the window. And so that is the actual electronics for this keyboard. But what that is, is the electronics for driving a keyboard. So what I need to do now is take this keyboard matrix so we've got rows and columns. So that looks like mostly columns. And this looks like mostly rows. So I'm just going to pull these layers apart. This is annoying, actually. I was hoping I was going to be able to trace this with a multimeter, but I have actually destroyed a couple of the traces, so that will not work now. Anyway, so we've got mostly rows here, and then we've got mostly columns here. So what I'm going to do is, using these traces, figure out which things go to where. Those first eight tracks there are rows, and the remaining tracks are columns. So there's actually two different ways I could reverse engineer this. One is to look at all of the traces that come from these various different things and relate them to the keys on the keyboard and figure out that, okay, I know that's the escape key there, so I can just follow that track back to where it goes. And likewise, on the other grid, I can follow that one back to where that goes. Or I could take this PCB and just plug it into a computer and short out a lot of these pins because I know that these first eight are the rows and I know the rest are the columns. And so I could just actually progressively, just one at a time, short out every combination of these pads and see what key press that gives me. I might actually do both. Okay, so at this point, there might be two questions in your mind. First one might be, why do keyboards even use a matrix? Simple answer is economy of input lines. Basically, if you have more than a few keys to address, if you have separate wiring for every single key, that quickly gets very cumbersome and you run out of data inputs for your microprocessor to be able to process them. And so a matrix of keys gives you basically the product of the rows multiplied by the columns in terms of buttons you can address using just those input lines. And I suppose the second question you might have is, okay, this keyboard uses a matrix, but why is it such a weird layout? And that has to do with ghosting. So in a keyboard matrix, just a standard keyboard matrix, if just one button is pressed, you can tell that one button is pressed because it just lights up the two coordinates, the row versus the column. If two buttons are pressed, you can still read them because there's no other combination that produces those outputs. Once you press three buttons, if two of them are on the same row or column, you get in a situation where you can't tell which buttons have been pressed. And actually, you might think the wrong button has been pressed. More expensive keyboards, by which I mean ones that don't cost three pounds in a charity shop, overcome this by a variety of different methods, including diodes and different ways of scanning the keyboard. This keyboard doesn't have those safeguards. And so what they appear to have done here is wired the rows and columns in such a way that the keys that you're likely to press in combination, like Shift or Control and Alt, aren't on any of the same rows or columns. It's still only got what they call two-key rollover. It's just a little bit less likely that you're going to collide with the inherent two-key rollover of this simple keyboard matrix just because they've separated some of the keys that you will press in combination. But I think we've probably sidetracked a little bit too far there. Okay, based on a really cursory analysis of the keyboard matrix layout, I have established, I think, that this trace here, which is the leftmost of the rows, and this trace here, which is the leftmost of the columns, should give me the letter Q. So, I'm going to plug that end into my old laptop. This is my very, very old notebook that I use for sound recording mostly. And we'll test my assumption. So 
off screen I'm just going to short out those two pads with a little jumper. Here we go. So it's that one and that one. Here we go. And I'm right, there's, there's the letter Q. Cool. Okay, so just got to do that with the rest of them and we'll figure out what all of those things are. So here's the plan, using this piece of prototyping board and these little momentary switches and these teeny tiny keycaps, I'm going to make my own keyboard. Now, slight bit of disappointment with these keycaps. They do fit onto a, a square post in the middle of the switch, but there's about a few degrees of rotation there, which is a nuisance because I thought that I was just going to be able to build this keyboard and leave it bare like this but it looks like I'm going to have to make a mask to go over this to keep those keys aligned, otherwise it's going to be all wonky. Because my donor keyboard was a full-size keyboard, I am tempted to make the world's smallest full-size keyboard, but I probably will slim it down and lose the numpad. I might keep the nav cluster if there's space. So now I've just got to populate this with switches. I've drawn a layout in PowerPoint that I think will work. It's possible to put these switches you can put them staggered like that or staggered like that. You can't put them, well, if you if you want to put them staggered half and half, you have to have an extra row because of where the little contacts are, because of where the pins are. I'll show you what that looks like from underneath. You can put them with the pins on the same row if you stagger them like that, or you have to have them on a separate row. Okay, so there it is, and we've got the function row, we've got the regular alphanumeric rows. Spacebar, I can't make a spacebar, so I'm just going to put two space keys down here so that you can hit one or the other of them. I'm not going to try to bother with stabilized wider keys like the spacebar or a bigger caps lock or return button. They are just going to be single buttons just to keep things simple. Uh, so over here we've got the little nav cluster and then page up, page down and then home end, delete, insert, backspace is there, enter is there. So now I've just got to solder this all in and then start wiring it up. Of course there is always the possibility that I can make another board to go on here for my numpad. Depending on the form factor I go for on this device there probably is still space for that because it's got to be about the size. So the actual computer itself has got to be about the size of a sheet of A4 paper. So there is room for a numpad on there if I choose to build one additionally. And I can easily do that and carry the wires across. Just put a little ribbon cable on there or something like that and connect them across. So it's a possibility. Anyway, soldering time now. So I bought myself a soldering station because I thought it might be... I'm going to be doing a lot of soldering here, so I thought I might as well get a proper soldering station with temperature control. This was fairly cheap on Amazon, but I got this card in with it. You won the prize. And all I have to do is contact this email address or scan this QR code. I only can get the prize by contact the seller email address within three days. Well, I did that, but the email address bounced and the QR code goes to a dead website. So I guess I did not win the prize. 
And I imagine this is going to be one of these things where you get the free gift in exchange for writing a gushing five-star review on Amazon. So probably best I didn't. Anyway, this is going to create some fumes. And I don't want to sit in a room full of fumes all day. So I've got a little USB fan. I've got a tumble dryer hose, which just happens to be the right size to fit on there. So the plan is, there it is, I'm going to secure that in place with a bit of tape, and then I can run this hose, this hose is three meters long, I can run that out of the window, and hopefully that will catch most of the fumes. Obviously it's got to drive them down that tube, and this fan was not designed for that, but if it gets some kind of airflow going, it's going to be better than me sitting here breathing fumes. Okay, not pretty, but we've got a gas tight seal on there. The weird thing is with this is you just touch the base to activate the thing. It hasn't got a switch as such. Um, and I'm using it obviously not as a fan, but as an extractor, but same difference. Let's just see if that works. Oh, that works really well. Look at that. Yeah, that'll do. This is just going to be a laborious job of soldering in all these little pins. Not really actually very sure that I've made those good solder joints very good. Let's have a look. Rate my soldering. Might need to actually just heat those a little bit more to flow them down onto the pads, but I've got to be careful. It doesn't actually really matter because I'm not using these pads as such. I'm going to solder wires to these, so as long as they're mechanically held in place, they're going to be fine. sloppy here. I noticed I've dabbed solder onto the pads adjacent to the pads. Just need to get a bit more tidy. I think I might have needed to clean that bit sooner than I did. Still haven't caused a problem I don't think. Okay last couple of joints now and then I'm just going to give this a good look over with the magnifying glass just to make sure I haven't bridged anything or any made any dry joints. Doing remedial work on the soldering at this point is going to be a lot easier than it will be later in the project. So I'm going to check that right over now. I'm reasonably happy with that. I think the quality of my soldering improved as time went on there. It has been a long time since I did this much soldering. What's interesting is that these circuit boards are quite flimsy, but now that I've soldered all of these switches in, they've kind of reinforced it and given it a lot more rigidity. Anyway, that's the keyboard. That's going to be the clickiness of the keyboard. Yep, there's only one place where that was bridged, and it wasn't bridged. It was bridged to an empty pad, So, but I fixed it anyway. I'm happy with the rest of the joints. I'm just going to slap some keycaps on there now so we can get a feel for what this keyboard will be actually like. I've got a plan for putting legends on these keycaps as well. I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to use my laser engraver to tattoo them which comprises painting them with a pigment and then melting the pigment into the keycap with a laser. It's kind of like laser engraving, but where I will use an ink on there as well, it will kind of tattoo the ink into the plastic. I think that's a valid term, tattooing, laser tattooing. Obviously, there's not a lot of key travel on these, but you know, this is a portable device. This is not going to be ha having a lot of typing done on it, but I did want to have a, f a kind of full function keyboard so that it can potentially be used to type anything without needing weird key combinations to get to standard characters. So it is going to be a kind of, kind of almost full size keyboard. But yeah, as you see, the, these keycaps are not staying aligned which I think would be really annoying. So I'm going to cut a kind of matrix grid to slot over the top of that, which will which the keycaps will poke up through. And then that will keep them nice and neat and tidy. And it will keep dust and dirt 
off of the key switches as well, which is good. Right, I'm going to populate all of these and then back in a moment. And yeah, that's what the keyboard is going to look like. So I'm quite happy with that. There's enough space there for two finger typing, which is probably about all we can really expect to do on this device anyway. So yeah, now I've got to create the matrix on the back of here. Kind of weird thing about these little switches is I hadn't actually tested to see which way they work. So what happens is these two pins are naturally connected to each other. So are these two. And when the button is depressed, all four pins are connected together. So these, this pair is connected to this pair. So the connection is across the switch like that, which is fine. It doesn't really matter as long as I know which way it works. But just to confirm that, so if I just get my multimeter here, we can see that those two pins are already connected together, whereas those two pins, diagonally opposite, are connected when I press the button. So to assist me with soldering this, I've made a diagram of the keyboard layout and I've flipped it and printed it the other way as well so that when I'm this way up, I can know, for example, that this key in the top right hand corner this time is escape. And over there is end, home and so on. Now I've got to refer back to my spreadsheet because that will give me the rows and columns for all of this matrix that I've got to make. Right, this is not pretty and I'm not proud, but it is working. So I've just put some pieces of wire through these holes here and soldered them in and then I'm just sweating them onto the terminals of this circuit board. The traces on this circuit board are so thin that there's hardly any copper there to actually solder to. It's obviously it's not designed for this. It's designed to have a carbon ribbon attached to it but we're doing okay and what I'm doing actually now is then then just testing for continuity by just poking through the solder mask there and just testing the resistance just to see if I've got it alternatively I could have done this the right way you know the way everybody else does it but where's the fun in that so that's the rows now I've got to do all the columns and I have run out of this wire actually, I've only got a little bit of this left, so I'm going to have to find some more of that. And then we'll do the same with all of these columns. Okay, well that was not a soldering job I'm tremendously proud of, um, but it's done. So I've transferred all of these tracks here onto traces on the PCB. I've had to offset them a little bit here because I ran out of space and I had to use, start using thinner and more flexible wire because the pitch on this board is smaller than it is on this one. This cheap perf board is very, very easy to lift traces on, actually, if you put the soldering on, on there for too long. So anyway, the next thing to do is going to be to test this because it was really, really difficult to solder to the these traces on this PCB because they were only designed really to have pressure contacts on them. They were seem to be really really thin copper I might be a bad workman blaming his tools here but I had a heck of a job trying to solder to these traces and I think I might have destroyed a couple of them if I have I've got some wire glue that I can use to repair the tracks so all I would have to do there is just probably scrape back to the copper there and then create a little bridge of glue to the wire okay that was fun there were three or four traces where the solder hadn't made very good contact with the pad. So I used some of the wire glue to repair those and that has worked. So I've now tested all of these traces by just shorting them out with a piece of wire using examples from my spreadsheet and I've tested that every one of these little pads here works. So the next thing to do is now to wire the keyboard matrix and so I'm going to, I've sorted my spreadsheet by the columns which is these pins here first, rows start at that end. So I'm going to take column zero and then find the keys that correspond with it and sort them kind of in the order I want to wire them, which is what I've called new index on my spreadsheet. And I'm going to use this basically to reference where I need to go. So this column zero needs to go to escape one, the little, uh, the little backward single quote, then it goes to Q tab A 
and Z. Okay, I'm going to use this wire. This is magnet wire, it's enameled wire, and what happens with this is, if you do it right, the solder, the soldering iron just burns the enamel off in the places where you actually heat it. So it should be okay to run this across the matrix and it won't short out to anything, but where I solder it and melt through the enamel, it should make a contact. That's the theory. I found another use for these little plastic pins, which these are sequin pins. And these will be useful in just guiding where the wire is going to go, because I want to keep this layout as neat as I can. So I'm going to solder onto there, and then I'm going to go round there and round there to make a nice straight piece of wire. But I think first what I'll do is I'll just give that a stretch. So I've got a nice straight wire, soldering iron on. Now I shouldn't need any extra solder here. It should be possible to just touch these onto the existing solder connections. Just got to wait for that to heat up. It's good soldering iron, it heats up really nice and quick. Uh, we'll have the extractor on. I don't think this will make much fumes actually because this most of the most of the flux has now actually gone. Okay, so that's connected onto there now. I'm just going to run it now around that pin, around that pin, which takes me to my first contact, which is that one for the escape key. And this thing about the, the enamel just burning off of this wire, kind of not true. It really does take a fair old bit of heat, which I suppose is a good thing. So really, I've now just got to plug on and do the same thing. So I've done row zero. I've now got to go and do row one. I'll do all the rows, then I'll do all the columns. The columns start at this end. So I don't think I'll show you all of that. I'll probably just plug on and get it done. And then we've got to go and do the task of testing to see if key presses actually create key presses. Okay, something's just happened and it's changed everything. And I think actually this video is going to change from being a video about a project to a video about how to stop a project, how to decide to stop doing a thing. So this whole project has been like an exercise in the sunk cost fallacy, which I've mentioned before in other contexts. But the sunk cost fallacy is where you keep going at a thing because you've put so much effort or cost into it already. It seems a shame to stop now even though actually it may be getting harder and harder to make any progress. Let's have a little recap and then I'll tell you what's actually gone wrong here. This PCB I took out of a very cheap keyboard and I reverse engineered the whole keyboard matrix and made, us, made myself a big spreadsheet so that I could use this PCB to drive my own keyboard matrix. Nothing wrong with that theory, but in practice it turned out to be more difficult than I thought because I had trouble soldering to these little traces for one thing. That could just be my soldering skills, but I think actually these traces are designed to work with a pressed on carbon film rather than solder onto them. So they're probably a little bit thinner than they would be if they'd been solder pads. Maybe not, I don't know. So I kind of overcame that by using some, by getting some of this wire glue and I've wire glued a few of these things on and that works. But soldering this keyboard matrix is harder 
than I thought it would be. And what's actually happened here, there's two things going on here. One is that this enameled copper wire, it takes a bit more heat than I thought it would to burn through the enamel on this. And so in the process of kind of soldering these things onto there, I'm making a real mess of the soldering. And I think actually probably melting the solder pads away from the PCB in a lot of cases. So it's just got really, really messy. It made a mess of the joints. I bridged a few things which I had to then scratch through and repair and so on. So that got a bit difficult. And then I got about probably two thirds of the way through wiring the columns and realized I've been doing it wrong. Or at least I've made several mistakes on this board and it's going to be very difficult to actually backtrack and undo them. Partly because of the damage done by all this soldering. If I go and unsolder this now and start again, I'm going to have a, probably an unusable PCB here because it'll just lift too many solder pads. And if I try to use a brand new perf board, it means I've got to go through the whole process of trying to get this thing soldered in place again, which it was hard enough the first time. I'll show you what the problem is, or rather I'll show you how I caused the problem. These little tactile switches have got two sets of pins which are shorted in pairs. So that, that pair is connected together, that pair is connected together, and when you press the button it connects across the four. Except if you want to pack them really tightly on this perf board, what you end up having to do is, I've got them there like that, I've got that switch there like that, so if you want to put them really close together on the circuit board, you have to nest the pins like that, which is fine. But the problem is that when you've got these keys nested like that, it can be a bit confusing which of those pins belongs to which switch. And so this pair here and this pair here belong to the lower switch. And then this pair here and this pair here belong to the upper switch. And that's not all that confusing when it's only two switches. So when you add further switches into the mix, you end up with potentially quite a confusing array of pins. And hands up, that's what I've done. I've gone and got myself confused about which pins are which, and I've soldered to this pin here thinking it belongs to the switch that's in this space, but in fact the switch that's in this space is using these four pins. I could just move that across but I think I've done the same mistake in lots of different places. So it would be a case of scrapping this and starting again. So unfortunately, this is going to be a project that goes no further. I've decided the best thing to do here is stop and stop throwing more effort at rescuing this project, which is a bit of a non-starter. Bit of a shame, but there we go. So I'm going to have a different approach to making a keyboard. I'm going to scrap this and start over with a better plan. So sorry I've made you sit through a really long video about something that isn't going to come to fruition for a little while yet, but I think it was interesting anyway to see the various steps along the way here that all seemed reasonable at the time. But when you look at the sum of all of those steps, it's a lot of effort to get to something that just gets harder and harder as you go along. So watch this space. I'm not going to shelve the idea of making that mobile computer, but I am going to rethink this keyboard thing. I don't know whether I'll rescue a keyboard matrix from a keyboard. That was a heck of a lot of effort, uh, reverse engineering that whole keyboard matrix. It took me days to do that. So it would probably take less time for me to just buy a QMK module and design my own keyboard matrix. There's a bit of a learning curve there, but the amount of time and effort I've kind of invested and poured into this is probably greater than that would have taken anyway. So I suppose the lesson I want to take away from this is that, uh, I mean, I love doing things the wrong way. Sometimes you can discover really interesting stuff if you take a different route to the route that everybody conventionally takes. And that's lots of fun. This started to not be fun. And yeah, it's time to call a halt. And this is just one of these cases, I think, where people would describe this as the wrong way for a very good reason. It's not a productive way to make a keyboard. So, got some rethinking to do. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoyed watching this video anyway, even though the conclusion is perhaps a bit disappointing. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.